aggressive in that qualifier, going through the upper bracket, getting that decisive 2-0 win over Immunity. Really big underdogs in that match coming through so spectacular. They have really interesting carries across the road. Carlos has got his Aurelia. CNJ, we've already talked about the Ezreal and Caitlyn. There's a lot of, even the AP Nidalee coming out of Moyo. There's a lot of interesting picks right here. And it'll be interesting to see whether we see the target bans coming out from Legacy or whether they've really done their research, because you have to think they were focusing on that Chiefs game. So much pride on the line in game one. They might have thought, hey, we'll enter this game 1-0, we'll be confident, we'll be in our wheelhouse. No, they were behind the whole game against Chiefs, and they need to be the aggressors here if they want to take a win off, off Fournot. Well, let's have a look. Here we are to Champs Lake for our next game. result. Fournot on the blue side here for this game. Legacy over on the red side. LeBlanc and Rexai have been banned out for Fournot. And Cassidy and that Aurelia that you mentioned, Papa, has been banned out by Legacy. I like to see that specific ban. He looked so capable on the Aurelia did Carlos' guard. So I do like the ban coming out right there. Of course, it does mean we're going to see a lot of those interesting meta picks coming through the picks and bans right there. And even last series, we saw a lot of champions who maybe in the LPL would have been snapped up, falling through the draft completely. So there's definitely an Oceanic meta coming together here. The Hecarim was the start of it. I know we're going to see some Malphites later in, whether it's today or, or later in the, uh, in the league, just because that's a really big Oceanic champion right there. But another ban comes through, it is the Azir. Yeah, we have to see Azir did get picked up there by Fournot, so that's going to be their last ban. And of course, Legacy now have to contend with their last one as well. Interesting to see what they want to leave up. Very different patch now as well on 5.2. Tristana, of course, disabled, but Lee Sin actually are targeted against Naya, and Jana gets snapped off by Fournot. All right, the meta picks do start when, when it comes to Jana right here. Jana's so, so strong right there. CNJ, though, he loves the Caitlyn and Ezreal. So, I mean, Jana, Ezreal, very, very weak laning phase. Maybe to me, maybe it might even suggest that we might be seeing the Caitlyn coming out here. It might be a little preview of the AD carry pick coming out because the synergies there between Caitlyn and, 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 and Janna has that wave pushing option right there. But still, a very safe first pick coming out from Fortnite. Yeah, Janna just as you said, so strong and so safe. So a strong pick there for Fortnite. Be interesting to see if we see maybe some other picks come through as well. Legacy can consider their options, of course, as well. But we could see, I mean, it's funny that Tristana's disabled. Caitlyn, who you mentioned, sort of feels a little bit like old Tristana. Of course, Tristana receiving a lot of changes on this patch. Yeah, Tristana. It's got a completely different flavor. It's going to be a couple of weeks till we see her enabled. Has some interesting burst targets right there. They were thinking about locking in an AD carry. The Narvan combo. We've talked about it a few times. When it's successful, it's such a treat to see. But that's some amazing team fight wombo combo coming out from Legacy. Yes, yeah, so really strong picks. Na and Jarvan going to go into the mix there for Legacy. That Narvan combo, like you mentioned. Fortnite now going to consider the rest of their options. It's funny that we talk about a bit weaker lanes in the bottom lane, a bit more laning going on. Fournot had a, some very dramatic games, shall we say, especially in the first half of their qualifier. They smashed through immunity in the qualifier in an upset to get here. But their round against Sudden Fear was a very long three-game series where CNG and the rest of Fournot came really strong through the late game. So they've got a lot of options here. This would be Fournot in a nutshell if they picked it up. We're not going to give them a bit of time, but that is... That is a treat to any people who've watched their qualifiers with Fournot in them. Yeah, that initiation combo, the AoE Wombo right there. The Wukong has definitely fallen out of the meta. It's, it was sin for a little bit, especially in NA. St. Vicious especially loved that jungle Wukong. And then Wukong kind of fell off a tree. I mean, there wasn't any real big nerfs there or anything. He just fell out of competitive play. But the team fight Wombo on both sides. You have to think whoever layers just, you know, between Narvan and this Orianna Wukong combo, whoever layers those skills the most appropriately, is going to win a fight in an explosive manner. Yeah, it feels like Fortnite just never wanted to stop playing this. Wukong Orianna, their signature combo almost from the qualifier, going to come here in their first ever OPL game. I kind of like Janna in the mix as well. It gives you a couple of disengage options. I mean, we talk about big team fights being, I think Janna very good at negating those. And it's one of those situations where, you know, you come into your first OPL game, your first professional league game as a player for these Fortnite teams. Best, definitely their biggest game so far. And you wonder, all right, are they going to go with the meta picks? Are they going to go with the comfort picks? Usually the comfort picks are about safe laning, moving into team fights. This is all about AOE Wombo. This is saying, all right, our comfort is aggression. Our comfort is Wombo. Let's go for it. Yeah, we'll see Legacy considering their last few picks as well. Had a pretty reasonable trunk in the bottom. EG maybe getting caught out a few too many times just by the Ari, which is so good at picking people off. But they do run it. Thresh and Graves, a much more aggressive bottom lane. It was very un uncharacteristic of, of uh, Egym to really struggle. I mean, even on the world stage, uh, Egym looked really great. Remember his Alistair games at Wildcard were wonderful to see. So he's usually the rock that this team is built upon. And Carbon especially struggled in that previous series. Was almost irrelevant after some very nice uh, pickoffs on, on Siva uh, on that Rek'Sai. side. really did struggle on that champion right here. So going for the more ganking potential. You know all exactly what to expect out of a job. There's going to be a lot of lane pressure coming in. 
and I expect Legacy to try and play this game on their terms after kind of hanging back and giving the win away to Chiefs. Yeah, and it's funny when we talk about Legacy as a team, there are a lot of different things you might be able to say. They've certainly played a lot of late game in their time. That's how they sort of came onto the scene middle of last year when they won their first tournament. But Carbon Shot Calling really is the, the force behind this team. And Choo Choo's playmaking, I guess, if you really want to wrap it up succinctly. And Legacy so far, when they look lost, they look really lost. And Team Fortnite, though, going back to comfort again. Ezreal's the pickup and the rise there as well. And that looks like top lane rise. And my eyes widen as we see the rise looking right here. We haven't seen rise since Worlds, basically, since we saw the adjustment in his Q values right there, Rise kind of fell off a, a tree just because he can't, couldn't trade as well. He almost had to rely on his autos rather than his Qs to harass just because 30 base damage so low on that ability. And Rise kind of got pushed out of the top lane after being pushed out of the mid lane many moons ago. But they're really confident. They're going to go with the Rise versus Nar matchup here. I have to say, Pace 2 time, I don't like the potential of this Rise against Nar. Nar is such a lane bully. We're at 5.2, we've seen a few nerfs come out for that Nar, so maybe it's not the oppressive state of a release Nar, but... Man, Ryze doesn't have many options, and if he uses his mana to trade, he's going to have so, such a hard time last hitting down against this mana list Nar. It's going to be a struggle for Carlos' god. After so many amazing games on Aurelia, on a champion where you can be proactive and reactive, to go for this really reactive Ryze is a surprise to me. Yeah, we'll see. The last pick does come through. Legacy pick up Syndra there for Choo Choo's in the midlands. They're going to take a mage into battle this time around. Took Lulu into the last game. Something a bit more aggressive. And you kind of said it earlier that Legacy just feel like they've got a much more pro proactive comp. This is very much a pick comp, pick comp in a lot of ways. And this is where you want to be as an established team against kind of an upstart is, all right, we're going to play the pick game. We're going to be on the front foot all the time. We're not going to play the Hecarims and Callistas of the world and let you take the game to us. We're going to dictate the, pay the pace. And when you see... Ejim on Thresh, when you see Choo Choo's on Syndra, you know, when he's not playing an assassin, he plays that ranged assassin or off assassin in Syndra, you know how aggressive he's gonna, they're going to be on these champions. And this should be the legacy that we expected in game one. And I mean, it's kind of interesting that maybe if we could talk to them, what they thought about their game one draft. Because like, as you said, lots of very in vogue picks, but maybe not the way that we like to see them play. And again, they've played lots of different comps, but really their strength comes from playing together and knowing their win conditions. And maybe in the last game, they just weren't too sure what they wanted to be doing. I think if we put these two, two, two games together, the Chiefs loss, and then this game right here, we're going from reactive and people also playing champions that are a bit different. Of course, with the role swap, we saw a very tallywhacker champion coming out um, at 80 carry, but the, seeing the Hecarim top, that's a different flavor of top lane than you would have expected. Seeing the Callista at 80 carry, you know, that's, a, that's a champion that, that Tallywack has been bringing up through the solo queue. They went for their kind of solo queue picks, their more comfort picks. They were definitely with the identity of the player rather than necessarily the role, bringing something different. And they didn't work in that first game. The comp didn't come together. Now it's more of a trademark legacy comp right here. We'll see more of a flavor of whether the role swap was successful or not. Okay, we shouldn't judge it completely on just day one's performance, but at least a bit more of an indication of what to expect with this revamped lineup. And the thing as well, kind of moving to Fortnite's comp, is that they have some pretty... Very, again, trademark stuff for them here as well. And it's not maybe the strength of a lot of the picks that are on the Legacy line. Not something that you're used to seeing, not the in vogue, the meta picks, but for not, you know, they might be playing from a season or two back, but they have very comfortable champions. And I also, I just love the fact that Carlos' God is clearly putting himself on more of a carry champion. And we'll have to watch this rise very closely just to get a flavor of what to expect from this nerfed rise. Basically, after that nerf, after the base damage nerf on Q, we saw basically no rise picks. You don't see rise anywhere. So... To really see how he, how he lines up against a lane bully like Nar, it's going to be information for us that will help inform all scenes just to get a flavor of whether this is a competitive matchup for Ryze or whether he'll really struggle. Yeah, and the Wombo there as well coming through. When we talked about Wukong Oriana being a staple for Fauna already, they're going to take that combo into this game. CNJ is back on his real surprise, everyone. He's playing his comfort champion. He hovered Caitlyn there as well on the champ select, but clearly just wants to go into this game as comfortable as possible. And that's a very good strategy for Fauna, not just going into their first game, but going into their first game against a team as good as Legacy. Absolutely. Going on a comp you really practice on, one that they've done through multiple metas with, with good success is a strong move for them here. But Legacy also have champs they can fall back upon. Here. Really comfortable picks coming out and such a crazy mid game. Whenever Jarvan shows up in a lane, he's got so much CC between the Mega Nar ultimate, Syndra's stun. I mean, if you get hooked by this death sentence, the burst from Graves and of course Jarvan, I mean, every time, uh, we see Carbon get a successful gank off. I expect to kill just because of so much pick pressure right there. And if Legacy can get that vision snowball in the mid game, 
they should take out this game. Yeah, kind of curious with the roll swap as well. Just how well Kadra plays this. Now, Tallywacker actually was one of the first plays in Oceania to bring out Nara on a big stage. He played it at the last event, the regional final, at the end of last year at PAX Australia. He was a really strong Nara player. Everyone's kind of like, eh, not sure how good this champion is. Like, guys, it's this good, trust me. It was just one of those champions, even released Oriana was the same, where people took a while to figure it out. Once they really mastered the champion, the, the amazing laning potential and then the Mega Nar team teamfight transformations are insane. And Taliwaka, I guess he was ahead of the meta, but with the role swap, he's just going to have to advise Kajud here to really take advantage of all the potential of that Nar pick. And maybe the jungle matchup is something to look at as well, because it's very different. And we talk about Jarvan being one of the, if not the strongest jungler right now, but we've got Wukong here, which is maybe seen a season ago, and even then it wasn't that frequent. And it's one of those cases with the new jungle, the much more vicious jungle, you know, shades of season one jungle coming out of the season, uh, the 2015 season jungle right here. You take a lot of punishment in the jungle. Even if you're able to use your decoy to tank some damage, you take so much damage in the jungle that you find it very hard to skirmish. Wukong only has those uh, damage skirmish ganks before level six. Once his ultimate comes up and you get a counter gank, incredible. But before then, especially if... Carbon gets on top of him. He, they are not going to be able to skirmish. And the lanes provide the skirmish advantage for Legacy right here. So I expect Naya to play very passively, farm up to the jungle, farm to six, and just hope that this Jarvan can't get a success in the early game. Because it's very hard for Wukong to play reactively until he has that ultimate. And maybe in general, if we wanted to characterize just what the teams look to be going for here, just based on the early draft, it kind of seems like Fauna are going to go back to maybe a bit more kind of a bit more late game. And Legacy are going to definitely shift gears up and go straight for the mid game, just like you mentioned. And I was most impressed by Fauna in that final game, the final two games against Immunity, when they played really aggressive mid game comps took the AP Nidalee in the mid lane, went for the picks, and were able to kind of close out a game. Because in the late game, they got really ahead in that game two against Immunity and then, with a poke comp, and then started initiating team fights. So their play calling was a bit off, and they, that, there was actually a situation there where Immunity realistically could have got back in the game if not for that uh, final uh, decisive fight coming out for Four Knots. So their late game shot calling, like any new team, is a bit patchy, so they're going to have to work on that and play their strengths here if they want to beat Legacy. Well, we are into the game now. Fournot versus Legacy. This will be Legacy's second game of the OPL, the debut of Fournot here as well. Fournot on the blue side, Legacy over on the red in a best of one. And everybody, in fact, both these teams here currently winless would love to pick up their first few points. Yeah, Legacy ending the day 0-2 would just be an unbelievable result for any seasoned followers of Oceanic League of Legends. But even for new fans, you have to understand this Legacy team, they represented the Oceanic scene at the International Wildcard. They had such a wonderful 2014, but it's a new year. It's a new league. There's a lot of new things right here, and Fournot is definitely not a team to overlook. No, not at all. They looked fantastic in the qualifiers, and Carbon has snuck his way around here. Carbon going to go in as well, and Carlos is like, I don't really like what's going on. Getting hit in the back, they forced to flash over. Carbon thought about following him, but does not instead with Oriana waiting over the wall, but really strong and creative pressure by the Javan. The pastry time, we were worried about Carlos's God's laning phase on Rise in a straight-up matchup against Nah, Without Flash in this situation, he's going to have to play so safely, so passively, positioned so far back in the lane against such a high-impact ganking jungler like Carbon's J4. How are you ever going to be competitive in this lane as a flashless Ryze? Yeah, a little curious that maybe Fornot didn't consider a lane swap either, although Ryze probably suffers against Gravestoche anyway in a 1v2. So very weak-ish lanes across the board, especially in the top lane for Fornot. But if they can get through feeling pretty comfy towards the mid lane game, they're going to have a very good team goal. I mean, cast your mind back to, say, Royal Club versus OMG at the, at the World Finals, and where we saw a lot of Ryze, and the one consistent strategy against Ryze was because of his low base stats, even if he picks up a Catalyst, just dive him, because he doesn't have many tools to deal with a turret dive. Now that he's had those base damages weakened, you expect the opposing lane to be higher health values. He's just as turret diveable here. He doesn't even have flash for the first five minutes of the game. I think it would be a mistake if we didn't see Carbon really targeting this rise because he has basically no tools to deal with the pressure of Nar and Jarvan. Yeah, it looks like Carbon actually might be making his way up right now, very early on. Could just be getting some vision down, but he's actually level two right now, looking to pressure the flash. Away from Carlson's God. I mean, he already got it. Going to go in. Flashes four gets very aggressive there. Lots of damage coming through. Carbon going to roll in as well, but not quite synced there on that one. And Carbon gives up his flash for good damage, but no kill. And Carbon is that shot caller, but there was little to no communication with his lanes. Or it just Carjo had a bit of a brain fade right there. As he went and he even used his flash aggressively. He realized he was going to take a turret shot, but must have expected the supplementary damage to come in from Carjo. Nowhere to be found. Yeah, one hyperproc probably enough. There with a boomerang for the slow as well, potentially. I mean, 
Either or, he's going to hit level 1, still does decent damage there. So, yeah, a bit of a misfire there on the early gank. The Legacy Jungle will give up his flash, but down the bottom now, see Taylor Rock and Ijin pushing in pretty aggressively, sort of what we expect in a Graves Ezreal lane. And we see pings on the minimap. Anaya was actually supposed to try to react to that with some early buff steals right here, but probably going to have to blow his flash. Makes the dragon angry. Actually tanks the damage, forces the flash out. Doesn't really want to stand there. So Fauna may be feeling the nerves a little bit here in their debut OPO game. Everyone flashing pretty quickly actually in this game. I want to speculate. I'm going to give, I'm going to give, I'm going to speculate for Naya and just say that maybe he hoped that doing any animation would suggest to Carbon that he'd flashed, but uh, Carbon wasn't buying at that time. A seasoned jungler like Carbon wasn't going to buy that and forced to use the flash. Yeah, just waiting there. Carbon over at his blue now going to pick it up. Carlos has got pushing. Min is being pushed through into his turret. He'll clean them out as best he can. Ryan's okay at hitting Min's in a turret, especially when he's health up, but he's struggling very early on. Kadra already 22 to 7 up. Absolutely. And this is what we'd expect in this lane. A resourceless champion against a nerfed Ryze is such a horrible spot for Ryze right here. The trades can be okay in a standout matchup. You know, in a one, in an instant trade for Ryze is usually pretty good. But uh, any sort of extended trade is going to be painful, to say the least, for the Ryze. And now you're going to continue his jungle, hit level 3 and go back. Carbon going to jungle a little while longer, though, at his wolf camp currently. So we'll see what... Does go back there. The early chilling smite picked up there for nice. So he's ready to go for a potential early bit of pressure. But without a flash for Wukong, it's going to be a bit awkward. I do like this pickup. He's actually got a pink ward so we can get some vision early on for his team. And that's kind of the case. If you're going for a level 6 jungler, if you're trying to rush that level 6 to really be impactful in a skirmish, picking up a pink ward or at least relieve some pressure from the lanes right there is a smart adaptation. It is indeed. It's the back down the bottom here. CS reasonable for Tally, but CNJ keeping up well. Zalo. And CNJ being forced a little bit back. Ejim trying to aggressively zone him here. Hook actually landing beautifully there. The shield comes down, but there's the buckshot. Tallywacker will get knocked up. And now Zaldo could be in a bit of trouble, but a very good trade for Legacy. The skill shots for Ejim were always one of the strongest parts of his play. And it was on full display right there, predicting CNJ's lane movement. They get a nice trade on them, but... No damage is going to super stick, even in this uh, no sustained Jana lane. No, Graves applies so much pressure in these lanes, though. Haven't seen too much of him, though. He's picking up a bit more speed, and it's nice to see Tallywacker pick him up here in the bottom lane now. And again, try and take it to Fawn a bit more. And this is Legacy already just from the early movements, much more aggressive than their last game. I just noticed that Naya just picked up their first blue buff at 5 minutes 30 into this game. So after that aggressive early invade, never path his way to the blue buff right here. It's going to be a very late blue buff for Orianna and going to struggle with Syndra. Yeah, Naya getting seen actually. The Scuttle Crab, I believe, revealed him off there with that speed train giving him away. Carbon up towards the top with his blue. Maybe looking for a dive with the help of Megan Albert. Carlos hugging that tower very tightly. He knows he's pretty unsafe here on Rise. And, and that kind of meta shift that we talked about when we saw some of these kind of outdated picks. We see Naya might be in trouble. Yeah, decoys away, Carbon gonna chase him in with a slow card and bounces in there on the knock. Carlos has got coming around, but Carbon moving in for the damage. Ryze actually doing reasonable amounts, but Carbon gets low but doesn't die and Naya gets first blood. Yeah, good assertive play coming out of Carbon and Kardred right there. Kardred picks up the kill to supplement the CS advantage. He's already grown in the top lane right here. But I was actually gonna refer to that. Look in the mid lane. It's not Morello Nomicons coming out from either of these mid lanes here. Surprisingly, we do see Choo Choo's go for a very defensive option in this laning phase. Kind of curious though. I wonder your thoughts, Papa, actually on why the build, especially for Choo Choo's, is not quite as aggressive as the usual Morel and Omicron. I mean, say. it is worth knowing that we've been used to, pat to, to casting on patch 5, and we have seen some gold adjustments coming out to the Morel and Omicron here. I'm not actually sure what the current group think is on Morel and Omicron and Athens. I just remembered people talking about how much mana rege regen uh, Athens had lost after the shifts in mana regen uh, changes they did sweepingly across, across patch 5. So... Maybe that is the consensus pickup right there, but still surprised to see. Yeah, I mean, the, the prices are definitely much more competitive. Merlin Nomakus, perhaps a bit too cheap in that last patch here. CNJ and Zelda will move down here, actually clearing out some space in the bottom line. BF Sword done for Tallywacker now as well, so he's ready to really start hard shoving these lanes. But CNJ got plenty of money to spend at the shop as well. Yeah, about a thousand gold uh, has been afforded here between the first blood and just being able to really boss around these lanes once they've blown Carlos God's flash at level one. It's finally up again here, so. He'll be very appreciative of that, but with that Hex Drinker pickup, any all-in, I think, is going to have to go on Kadra's advantage in the top lane right here. But Ryze has been doing competitively. Remember, he was so far down CS so early, it's important to know that that CS lead hasn't grown yet. Yeah, and Kadra, who was maybe 20-plus ahead or more in the early stages of the game, is still very far ahead, but as you mentioned, Carl's keeping up here. Ejim actually going to dive in towards the blue side jungle here, or the red side blue jungle, excuse me. Get some wards down, but not going to get too aggressive on that invade. I mean, the reason the Ryze isn't picked up anymore is that they thought, okay, Ryze had a pretty unsafe landing phase before. 
who was prone to those turret dives. Now with those little nerfs, those little shifts, he was that much more risky. But it's worth noting that late game, a couple of base damage nerfs are not going to affect Rise. Rise is still a late game beast, so it still has that mana hyperscaling. Can really be a beast in the team fight. We remember Go Going's Rise. It can still be achieved on this patch. It just takes that much longer, and games have been finishing a little bit sooner. That's, that's why we saw that pick fall away, but it's not forever. Good hook there, though. Onto Zelda. Is going to flame back? Tallywacker will get in now as well. Good damage there. Does not use the ultimate. Knows it's likely not a kill, especially with Sinjas heal up. But that's some great pressure again. Legacy really starting to bully this bottom line now. Yeah, I mean, EGM never stands statically. He always moves in. Goes for those kind of hidden hope hooks that really get uh, important advantage. He forced... Zaldo back to base right here, and they will pick up a Dragon off that. So that's a big advantage for Legacy. Yeah, good bit of control here. This should be the Dragon uncontested. Naya not even close on the Wukong, unfortunately. Ultimate does come through, but CJ will not steal it. And that will actually be picked up by Choo Choo's, but Legacy get the first Dragon. Yeah, we named the mid game as the important point. And, you know, nine minutes into the game, picking up that first Dragon is very good for Legacy right here. They have so much pick pressure. They have so much skirmish pressure when Carbon's available that we expect them to get that objective snowball. CNJ, smart moves in the bottom lane. Ejim really wanted that, but it's actually way too low. Maybe going in a bit too aggressive. Tallywacker uses the heal to save him, and there's collateral damage. But CNJ gets the first kill. Naya gonna dive around the back looking for Tally. Gets the knockup. CNJ with the shield and the double kill. That's why we talk about CNJ's Ezreal. He understands the limits. It looked like he was gonna give up a return kill for that Graves, but wonderful play to get into the secondary brush right there. The cavalry was just on time from Naya. He actually needed the Jana passive to give him that extra move speed. Still didn't have flash available right there. It came up at the last second, they secured the kill. And CNJ, that Ezra we talked about at 14-1-17 over the qualifying series right here. He's going to get going really fast on this blue Ezreal build. Yeah, We're going to yeah. see a replay actually here. I mean, it was a smart predictive hook from Egypt, but he actually eats so much return damage right here, he almost falls instantly. But CNJ is able to flash into the second brush. That losing the one auto attack there from Taliwaka, which would have been the answering kill, was completely the difference between an even skirmish and a one-sided one for 4 -Naught. Yeah, really strong play by 4 -Naught's bottom lane. And good timing by Nara as well. Perhaps a little too aggressive there by Egypt. We saw that a little bit in the last game when they played Chiefs as well. And Legacy were off to a good start, hitting all their key timings very early on. That was a bit of a setback. I like the movement from Ejim, but it's almost like he forgot that his base stats just weren't there to complement the amount of trade damage he was going to take. The pickaxe was the big difference. If that was just a tier, Ezreal, I feel like that trade would have gone significantly in, the, in that advantage. Adorable there. Carbon's very patient. Carlos in trouble, gets Cataclysm, and Carbon takes him out. The bait was so tasty for Ryze right there. He was like, yes, please, one little nah for me. Nope. And respectable trade damage as well. Carlos has got popped the ulti, able to get quite aggressive onto Kaldra, especially in mini nerf form. But Naya now, gonna have to be careful, might get tower dive too. And Kaldra gonna go in onto the Mega now, gonna maybe pop his ulti, pops him into the wall, and Kaldra gets an easy kill on the top. Now Moya gonna join in as well, trying to zone them off. But Moya's a bit low, the slow does come down. That's gonna be a shockwave draws in Kaldra, but Kaldra's flushed out. Moya gonna run in towards the tower now as well. Can he get to safety? Does. And Legacy are really punishing the top. It felt like the there map. was some 80 carry mechanics coming out from Kaldra right there. The predictive flash on the Shockwave was wonderful to see from Kajid right there, but the turret dive was interesting and it was only successful because the really little interesting uh, adaptation right there, he actually used the Na ultimate on the only targetable unit, which was Wukong's clone. I did not expect that whatsoever, but of course, the, the, the area of effect of that Na ultimate was just large enough to also launch. Uh, Wukong into the real Wukong, not the decoy. Oh, Carlos God's found Kaldra backing in the shop, and that's a pretty easy kill for Ryze. Bit of an aggressive back there. I did not expect such an aggressive back, but the heat's down bottom that's as well. That's a stun and a half. There's Zaldo in trouble. There's the Cinder ulti for the second kill as well. And Juju's casually strolls into the bottom lane for a kill. Summoner's Rift has become the killing fields here, Pace Time. Across the map, that's members of Fauna falling. I mean, Legacy, I mean, Kaja there, he was a bit greedy. He wanted to get that item build, and he was double-clicking on it, found his death tombstone instead. But down the bottom lane, wonderful roam coming out from Choo Choo Syndra. That's what we expect from a seasoned Syndra player like Choo Choo's to do right there. And they pick up a double kill from it. Yeah, and both the mid lane is actually getting frisky there into towards different lanes. Moya moved to the top and unfortunately got uh, killed there by in the 2v1. And with a good run from Chuchu's, picked himself up a kill and the secure as a second for his team as well. But things is done for both of them. Chuchu's about 10 CS ahead there in that lane. But there's a lot of wriggle room. And all of a sudden, without any talents being taken, there is a lot of action going on on this map. Yeah, 25 to 27 CS is the advantage up top. And importantly, that's all spent gold for the Rise. So he's still 700 gold away from the Rod of Ages. We we're expecting the tier Rod of Ages to come in 13, 14 minutes uh, in patches past. 
It's going to struggle to get it by 15 minutes here. So Carlos has got really struggling to get those power spike going. That's what we've seen in terms of power spike delaying coming out from that rise with the base nerf changes. He can't trade as well, so he gets his items that much slower, and you add about five to 10 minutes to the game before we see rise really as a late game beast. And that's just so much extra time as well to power up here, but if they can get their full out again, seem pretty well to hunker down for a late game, but C and J are not gonna have to battle Ejim and Tallywacker. Graves has come back almost completing an infinity. It's very aggressive arcane shift actually by C and J. Once they go in, Ejim looks for the hook, but C and J has already dodged back towards the minions. And again, staying very competitive, even in CS at least, in the bottom lane. It's not a favorable lane matchup for Ezra to go even here again, so C and J's uh, excellent play on that Ezra. Of course, the double kill would have helped him in getting a bit more lane presence. He's Overtuned in terms of items right here, even though that amplifying term doesn't offer too much. Yep, Naya actually duking in there with the deco. Carbon finds him though, and it looked up there for a gank. Did not find it. Carbon maybe thinking about a two of you, but four not have backed well and truly away. CJ gonna get hooked and played their tally going back in as well. Zaldo could be a target. That's a really good split. The ulti comes too, but it actually threads the needle. Carlos though, has come down as well. CJ trying to be the bait, but tally gets a kill that time. Monsoon there for Zaldo to reset tally. Potentially in trouble, but a good hook there will delay the kill, would not prevent it. And EGM now running for his life away from Carlos's God. The Q gonna move in, the snare comes in as well. Zaldo gonna line up, that was an amazing flash though. And the box gets the kill. Ejim, what an absolutely insane play. And now Carlos's God is absolutely dead. Naya chasing in as well. Good double stun there coming through for Chuchu's. Now Carbon gonna dive in, pop the ulti. There's the ulti there as well. Coming through for Chuchu's to pick up Naya and Moya. You better run, Oriana pops the distance. Carbon looks for the knockup. A good juke there from Oriana. Chuchu's might be able to get it in. The shockwave gonna come through now as well. And Carbon still chasing in, almost gets the kill and will secure. What an insane turn of events. Legacy understand the limits of their champions so well right there. And e Jim demonstrated it with aplomb. Ab able to flash away, get that burst damage in, kill the support there in a, just an amazing turn. And the cavalry were completely on point. They've turned this game on its head and now suddenly a 5,000 gold lead almost out of literally nothing. Yeah, and Legacy going to pick up their second dragon as well. Very good pace here for this particular objective. About 15 minutes or so, they'll clean it up and EGM, I cannot believe he made that play. Flashed through the giant tornado, played into the box for the kill. But Israel will go wide to steal the dragon and Legacy looking very strong. Looking excellent here, pastry time. It's a big turnaround from the first series here. And honestly, we're seeing a bit of the same flavor for Chiefs, but we're going to see a replay first. The first First hook comes onto CNJ right here. Now track this kill. He actually dies to a critical shot. He was not expecting this last crit from Tally because he'll count himself unlucky to have given up the first kill on that exchange. The rise comes in. Of course, they were baiting for Carlos's God the whole time. And in the minimap, nobody's actually coming down bot right here. So of course, Carlos's God probably thought, all right, this is going to be a nice little extra kill. But E Jim, he's got the evasive moves right here. It takes so long for Rise to shut him down. And I love the return burst on Zelda. Understand that situation. E Jim lives here. That's what I think you need to notice. She just has to flash to get the, the, the answering kill right here. But the moment the Chilling Smite comes onto Naya, there's not much Moyo can do right here. It doesn't have ability. To, he used his dissonance already for damage. Wasn't able to use it to open oh, up. Oh, Zelda face checks the brush, goes down to the buckshot, and Tallywacker puts in one more order. CNJ trying to get all the way out of the bottom lane. No help forthcoming. In fact, it's just Legacy moving down as well. A good flash for Ezreal to keep him safe, but Legacy are getting very aggressive. Legacy are all over the map, and CNJ is dead. He's in dead. trouble. Choo Choo's gets that kill with the ulti. Wow. It's just all coming together in the same game here for Legacy. And up top, it doesn't look like it's going to stop. No, Carter is going in on the castle. He's got Rise struggling to fight. Megan are out the back past his tower. He's pushed down one already. In fact, it's two quick towers for Legacy. But Carter Minino is going to force the flash out as well. And look at that CS advantage in the top lane. Close to 50 up now. There's a massive wave right there. Carter's got it. Really does not want to back away. There's so many minions. About three and a half minion waves crashing in. And Moya... This is unfortunately the downside of the Oriana pick is sometimes, especially in this Syndra matchup, if you're second to every skirmish, if you're second to every team fight in the first 20 minutes of the game, the game might be over before you get to that crazy late game AP Oriana. Yeah, Choo Choo's on tally actually gonna force some towers down. There's one going through to the mid tally. Gonna work on this one, probably commits to taking it out. CNJ cannot defend. And that will be four towers to zero actually there for Legacy. And all of a sudden, this gold lead has sprung up almost out of nowhere. 7,000 gold ahead. And now a blue buff steal as well for Legacy. And we said what Legacy needed to do was to get ahead in the mid game. They've just turned on a tornado in the mid game right here. And honestly, Fortnite are going to wonder what happened just because... Five, six minutes ago, this game was looking pretty even. Rise was struggling in top, but everything else is going all right. Carbon diving in, gets lanterned out. Naya, though, is in here as well. Carbon will get played back on Naya. Now the ulti coming in after the flash, and that will get the kill. Maybe Ejim going to get chased down now as well. The box gets popped. Castle's God's in there, and there's the double actually for Naya. So Legacy, perhaps a bit too aggressive there. 
In the transition, though, off screen, we did see Chuchu's once again assassinating the Oriana. Nothing that she could do right here. A lot of members coming, but a smart teleport from Kadrid will give them a defensive option. Flashing in there as well to get the slowdown. Naya in trouble with the hyper proc. He goes back in and knows he's dead. Tries to drink in the brush, but the kill actually goes to Chuchu's there as well. And this Syndra, 5-0 and 2. The two carries here are just completely massive. 8-2-3 between Syndra and Graves right here. They're getting picks up plenty, and Chuchu's is playing this champion, this Syndra, to a T. And you know what? Chuchu's did not have a poor performance on Lulu necessarily in the last game, but that is not his style of champion. We talk about Legacy, we talk about them being very together, having a lot of synergy. It's Carbon and Ejim doing a lot of the shot calling together, and they, they do make a lot of the plays as well. But I can tell you right now, if Chuchu's ever says, I'm making a play, his team follows him without question. And what we learned from that first series is that if they elect to play reactively, if they do Chuchu's champions that are going to really struggle in lane, that really have to scale up to the late game, their play calling felt really off. They really struggled to have any relevant team fights. But in this situation, where they went back to that more assertive play, where they gave Choo Choo's a playmaking champion instead of a reactive champion, it's a world of difference between these two series. I mean, Choo Choo's is just so far ahead. 5-0-2. Just picked up his Zonyas now as well to go with the Sork Choo's and the Athenians. We've got IE plus deal done for Talius. Ejim going to get aggressive with his AD carry down towards the Krugs there in Four Knots Jungle. The Four Knot. Not really allowed to play on the opponent's half of the map anymore. They've basically been caught off at the river. I mean, this is a 9,000 gold lead at 90 minutes, which is massive. That looks quite good there. Naya could be in trouble. He's away towards Eden. Maybe going to be safe. Tally going to go in. Naya knows he's dead. Good shield actually from Zalu. But it's not quite enough to save him. Not Carbon going to dive in onto the Jana, who's forced to flash out. CNJ flashes and shifts out as well. And there's Juju is dominating. Gets a kill into Ori with the ulti. Carlos is gone. Could be the next target. And Legacy just picking Fonod off like flies. That is the third solo kill from Chuchu. Chuchu's in terms of getting kills on Oriana during rotation. Chuchu's has always been first. He's been really taking advantage of all the aggressive wards that are down here uh, for Legacy and just catching off Moya unawares. She's nothing she can do once she hits that stun, the Syndra right there. And three solo kills is really the tail of the difference between these two teams. Yeah, Carbon going to take out the Scuttle Cup Dragon back in a minute now. So Legacy going to look to pick up their third consecutive Dragon in just under 22 minutes or so. So again, a really nice control of that objective as well. So they're going to force back. Carlos has got, did have his rod quite a number of minutes ago, so has been stacking up nicely, but it's going to take him a little while to get there. And you keep talking about the passage of time. It's so important here, Pace Time, because you look down the objective, zero turrets coming in for Fortnite. None of the dragons have gone to Fortnite. They've been shut out of objectives. And if you have this late game focused team, you have to stay competitive in objectives. Otherwise, that snowball is just going to be kill you. It's going to kill you. There's no point Arise showing up with three or four items if the other team has the five dragon buffs already. Yeah, and kind of a pretty big power dip here as well, potentially as Chuzan and Ejim actually going to go in. Oh, that's very cute. Steals away the red buff there by throwing it out. Actually, will reset and regen quite quickly, but Kadrid might be able to tank it around. Never mind, the red buff is going back to its home. Zinj so actually going to use his ulti. Choo Choo's again going to move the red buff back around. This time, they'll be able to secure it. Carbon, I believe, actually was a beneficiary of that. Perfect timing for Dragon. Some of Riot's recent changes with the soft leash is actually coming into effect. Why there's that, obviously, with a very hard leash with the... Uh, with the Syndra move, cause it to instantly reset. The second time, a bit smarter with the position, and they take away that buff and Dragon. Yep, really strong objective control. Continuing now for Legacy in their very powerful pick base mid game. Cop another pick here on Naya. He's going to use the decoy, but he actually just dies there to all of the AoE out of Legacy. And when your frontline is dying, that is bad news. And that is the second time that Ejim has set up these kills with very smart pink ward placements. Twice now, they've got a pick on a Wukong. And during the CC, he's put down a pink ward and a brush to give them that vision of the decoy. Wonderful, smart, adaptive play from Ejim right here. This is the Ejim I expected in the first series. Oh, Chuchu's actually going aggressive. Pops his on his Chalkwave will miss it, but he hits onto two cards. Are diving in. Pops White Moya into the wall, and Carbon is going to get that kill without any return there for Fortnite. Cardred so tanky in the Mega Now Form. And Legacy just picking them off. CNJ gets picked out of nowhere, and Carbon is going to get the double. Ejim's turning on massive this series. Again, the death sentences come in. Pick up the kills right here. I mean, Legacy don't even need to pick up those kills. They've picked up every other objective on the map. They're just having a bit of fun. They're just putting the exclamation points in. And look, they're playing themselves into form. And that's so important in the league since they've completely shrugged off that first game and reset their season right here. They really have bounced back nicely here for game two. 10,000 gold ahead. And let's see a replay. Yeah, Chuchu's here baits out the ultimate with much aplomb with that Zonia's. 
the ultimate onto Moya's good, but he, she just explodes the Orianna to the crit coming out from Ezreal right here. They tank a lot of damage, but watch Ejim right here. Death sentence number two on none other than CNJ. He dies instantly, and they can get away with a couple of kills and feeling great. Just again, such a strong lead for Legacy. 19-6 up in kills, 10,000 plus up in gold, and 5-0 in turrets. They're actually looking to shut out four out of objectives here in this game. Absolutely. The objective we said before, the objectives are looking very difficult for four not to claim. None of their lanes are really in a position. They don't have the ward coverage to even hope to go take down a turret when they have, in some cases, their inner turrets down as well. So there's no realistic first objective to, to really go for for Fauna. They're kind of looking for Legacy to make an over-aggressive turret dive, pick up a lucky ace and kind of push out the maps and get some very quick global gold. I mean, they're on life support here. 12,000 gold lead for Legacy at 23 minutes. And one of the things that Legacy have done so well in the last few minutes is exploit a big power dip here in Fornot's comp. We mentioned the Rise already needing to scale. Blue Ezreal has similar problems, and that's an Orianna without a needlessly large rod yet at 24 minutes almost. That is a big drop for Fornot to try and dig themselves out of. And you almost never see a 0-4-0 Orianna in a team game, just because, of course, Orianna has the shielding. She has so many supportive abilities. The dissonance in a team fight will get you assists. But she's been dying in the transition to every skirmish. There's never been a chance for the Orianna pick to really come up trumps in terms of utility. And it's certainly not going to come up trumps in terms of damage this game. Yeah, and Chuchu's continuing to grow in power now as well. Void Staff has been added to his inventory for even more of that pick potential that you were talking about. Moving down as well, I like that we're seeing something different now that we've had some changes on the 5.2 patch. We've got a Phantom Dancer to pair with that Infinity Edge for Tallywacker. I mean, the Phantom Dancer with that crit chance removed from the Infinity Edge is a smart pickup right here. He doesn't need extra wave clear on that team. They have Syndra for fairly instant wave clear. Just gives so much right-click damage coming here. And I guess what Fournot should take away from this series and what teams should be very reticent to do against an assertive mid-game team like Legacy or indeed the Chiefs, they went for that scaling rise in the top lane. Blue Ezreal has to scale up. They went for two tier champions and the game's over before those tiers can even transform. And unfortunately for Zelda, as we kind of look through the items as well, that Magi's is not helping at all in the power dip front either. Could maybe be Mikhail's, maybe even a locket just to help with some of the latent cinder damage. But other than that, Fortnite pretty much forced to defend basically at the Nexus. Yeah, scaling across the board against fully formed items right here. I mean, you just to compare some of these item builds. The, the, ma the Mana Moon, of course, not even translated into the Mura Mana at 25 minutes. And the Iceborne Gauntlet is the start of an Ezreal item build. But that's an 18-minute Ezreal item build compared to Infinity Edge, Phantom Dancer, sitting on probably what, over 1,000 gold right now, so could have that pickaxe as well. So much completed power coming through from Legacy. There's the potential on the, leg on the 4 knot side, but... I mean, what's potential if it's never fulfilled? Yeah, and you talked about Legacy as well with their item builds. I feel like maybe even if you skip the Blast Whispers, CNJ just gets picked off there by two. Just eat him again on the assist train there with that hook. Looking again, does not find Zelda. Neither could be in trouble, and the Siege is on Cardrid. So tanky, actually gets the ulti pop there by Castle's God. He tries to do damage, but the Mega Nar, even Mini Nar is actually pretty tanky with the Warmogs, and Legacy get to comfortably siege up this in hip turret. Yeah, and Ryze is not to the point here where he can kind of shrug off the frontline damage and explode someone. And of course, Chuchus has the stasis, has a defensive option. Off screen there, when we saw that kill coming onto CNJ, Chuchus was actually alone against three people. So Fornot probably thought, all right, he's just going to poke around. But could all in with Aplomb, knew that his team would rotate first. They're going to rotate top, as I say it, and pick up another objective right here. I mean, look, I'd be surprised if they can stop this objective. So I'd be surprised if they could even get a turret on the board here, Fornot. Yeah, strong movement there by Legacy to take out that other turret. And things are certainly dire here. For Fortnite's debut in the OPL Dragon back up in 45 seconds. That'll be the fourth straight Dragon for Legacy if they pick it up. And curious to see how aggressively Legacy want to play out their comp. Not necessarily because they have to, because they're worried about scaling at this point, but just for confidence in themselves. You know, we're ahead, we're super far ahead and we know it. How, how, what message can we really send to the other teams in the OPL? I mean, look, it's come across pretty damn clearly in the first 26 minutes, you'd have to think right here. They've completely shrugged off what was a fairly one-sided first series after the first 10 minutes or so. And I, I guess I'd rather focus on the 4 knot side here just because this is probably going to be another situation where 4 knot they'll enter their, their series later today trying to pick up that first win. It looks very, very difficult for them to pick up a win here. I'd just like to see the other teams really respect the power of these top teams, respect the power of Legacy, respect the power of Chiefs, Go for either a mid-game focused team or really understand that you can't afford to go scaling items in multiple lanes against a pick comp. Because if the pick comp ever gets ahead in the mid-game, you're never going to have that chance to farm up that tier if you really can't even auto-attack 
creeps because your whole jungle's watered. You can see Ijim and Teleworker already aggressive. Actually, basically 2v4. Amazing hook there, and Chuchu just wipes him off the rip. Now Naya diving in, gets the knock up there with his ultimate. Chuchu just pops the ulti and says, yeah, mine's a little better right now. Zelda going to get aggressive on Kadra, goes mega and does take the turret, but will pop himself out. And that was a ridiculous pick by Legacy. When Ijim's on form, you'd think that Death Sentence was a target ability right there. Took down Ezreal. Remember, Ezreal we're talking about, but the fight's on. Carbon their alley oops and finds Moya with the Cataclysm using Carlos as God as a springboard. Now Kadra gonna dive in, slowing him down there with the boulder toss, and that's another kill for Chuchu, who's a legendary Zelda, pretty much at his belt and trying to stay alive and might still die. Does survive, thankfully, the ignite not enough, but Legacy may just end the game here. Yeah, they're gonna take a bot turret right here. They have five members is strong, but the death timers are short at this point. Wukong's already back up here. Going to be difficult to finish off the game off that, so they'll back away here. Baron's a realistic objective. The fifth dragon's coming in in a few minutes right here. Legacy have an embarrassment of options for their next move in this game. Yeah, I think mean, then it basically all they need to do is not make some sort of horrendous error. And a team like Legacy with this much experience, that's pretty rare to happen. And Fortnite, you know, they'll play it out here. They'll see what they can get. Definitely get a feel out for playing on it. Maybe a bit more of a, a stage for them. Some who haven't, don't have as much experience. Actually, Carbon, no, does not get found out. No vision there for CNJ. So just try to look blind. I mean, with this 16,000 gold advantage and with the items they have picked up, of course, their front line is monstrously strong, especially this Nara. I mean, he's crazy in the front line. He's so tanky with that Warmog's armor being completed right here. Legacy can probably realistically afford one or two small mistakes and then to come back and win the game anyway. But I think it's more important to them to really play at that top level. Of course, they will have access to scrims through the week. They will have other practice options, but this is the top tier of competitive play right here. Play as decisive as possible. Don't take the pedal off the metal, because when the big games come in, they want to win those two. CNJ might be in trouble. He's in fact, as Ju just gets another off-screen kill. Just too quick for us to catch them. He's picking people off with so much ability, but almost finished a death cap now as well. And you're right, I think Fortnite just needs to say, hey, we're leveling up, we have ex we're getting experience. This is our first time playing really against these top teams. We'll take all of the experience we can get. And to that credit, they looked very competitive in the early stages of this game. And look, the comp they picked up, Rise Aside, seem to really play to their strengths. The, the team that really uh, played excellently in the qualifiers looked emphatic winners over immunity. We thought they'd actually make a real shake at the standings right here, but that's kind of getting that first introduction to the top tier of professional play. This isn't the Oceanic Challenger Series anymore. This is the Oceanic Pro League. And the step up seems to be pretty clear. Yep, Tutu at level 16 on the Syndra. Absolutely horrifying for Fornot to behold. Again, almost finished the death game. Doesn't really need it. Got a blue buff for his trouble as well. Sideways pushing left, right, and center for Legacy with that Baron buff down as well. And it's all but for the formality of this one. But Fornot are going to hang on to as many structures as they can. But unfortunately for them, they don't have too many left. No, they don't have too many left whatsoever. And you have to think the turret dive, once that Mega Nar transformation comes in once again, will be on. I mean, Egypt looked for a hook there as well. That could also start it off. And the cannon meaning we've seen it before. Oh, Ezreal will snipe it off. CNJ does get it. No Banner of Command this time, unfortunately. Rest in peace, Banner of Command, Invictus Gaming. One day we'll see it again. It was great here. His legacy is still going to continue this. He's trying to spread out. I like that. Just want to apply the Baron buff to as many minions in as many lanes as possible. But they've already taken out the bot in him. Kajit's working on this one with Tally, who just waltzes in and deals so much damage. A lantern there for safety. He's all Tally. Does actually get caught up there by the knockout, but he'll just stand and fight Naya. And Kajit's going to easily clean him out. The shock of just landing a Chuchu. Might go down. That's an amazing start. A good Zonya's there as well. Zelda looking for the reset. Chuchu's still not dead and finally does the Carlos is gone. But that's the rest of Fauna going down. A quadra kill coming out for Tallywhacker as well. That's the ace and probably the game, Papa Smithy. The roll swap comes up big right there. Four kills, but I love the unleash the power and instant Zonya's coming out from Syndra. She was eventually going to die there, but it doesn't matter for Legacy. They're going to finish out the game right here, shutting out completely in terms of objectives. No time to pick up that fifth dragon. A minute 30 to it spawns, but about five seconds till we see Legacy's first win in the OPL. So Kadra, they're teleporting onto a minion for a little bit of swagger towards the end. Clearly very happy to pick up his first win in the OPL as a top laner as well. And looked a little rough against the Chiefs in their last series, but really came back firing there against Fornot. Just an insane performance across the board from Legacy. And this is the difference in two series. When you see Carbon on form, they get the early ganks off successfully. And the laning power of Choo Choo's. He was kind of forced and shunted onto that Lulu. Could only really clear waves right there. Did that comfortably and delayed Swiffer from going off in that first game. But it didn't come play a plum. But in that second series, playing Syndra, the champion with the initiative in that Oriana matchup, 
he was just crazy. Yeah, we do have a replay to go to there as well. We'll see just how much damage Legacy could do. Yeah, it's a really early fight right here. I imagine we're going to see some EGM highlights very shortly, but we'll roll the tape right here. So EGM does get that first hook off onto CNJ, and a lot of damage comes in right here. The trades are on. And you'll see here the critical strike is actually quite lucky to pick up the first kill right there. 272 damage crit from that early uh, crit cloak coming out from Taliwakas. It's a very long and extended fight. So, of course, because the teleport came in from Carlos' god, they pick up the first answer. But Ejim uh, manages to open up so much time and for his teammates to react first to this situation. The burst kill onto Zelda was insane. And Ejim is actually able to walk away with his life in this situation. But the moment that... Legacy are the first to rotate right here. We see the kills come through. First, it's on Denia on the Wukong right there. The base stat's not coming through. It was just a sign of smart play calling and good champ focus when it comes to a team fight. It's what Legacy were really lacking in that first series right there. In the first series, you'll remember, they had two fairly fed tanks who kind of were always, in terms of positioning, weren't in front of their carries. It just didn't happen. It didn't happen on the same fight whatsoever in that first series. But they're play calling here. And the difference between Choo Choo's on that Lulu and on that Syndra it was night and day. He said the name already. I think Choo has to get so much credit, not just for his massive score and how well he played, but you said it. The catching Oriana in every single rotation, being the first of those ones, being the proactive mid lane that we expect, just a pleasure to watch. I mean, Oriana's the team fight general. That's what we always call her. Credit to Swain, of course. You know, he, he's his own kind of general, but... Oriana's all about influencing those fights with all that utility and, of course, the burst coming out from the Shockwave. But the Shockwave was basically irrelevant that whole series. It never was in the right spot because Oriana was dead. Yeah, and with that, we are going to pop up to a break, but don't go anywhere. The OPL is coming right back.